All right, perfect. So let me squeeze these windows here, Phil, so I could see your face and All the right, comments sure. of anybody that might be following us live. Sure. Uh, oh, it looks like I'm tilted this morning. What the heck happened there? <laughs> well, it's definitely not an earthquake unless- it, No, it's not an earthquake. I'm not in San Francisco where you are. So that, that'll have to be good enough. And then I can yeah. just lean the other way the whole time when we're talking. <laughs> but uh, Phil, like I say, I want to thank you for uh, joining me this morning. The whole purpose of these video interviews kind of is multifold. Uh, first and foremost, when I was in the army, like when you were in the Navy, I learned the most by asking, you know, senior NCOs and other lieutenants and my boss, you know, just kind of how things worked. Then when I got into becoming an entrepreneur with Craig Cummings, who you and I know both well in the bunker labs world, uh, again, it was all about asking questions of those around me. And mm -hmm. what's different about COVID is in all those cases, all those other people had been there, done that ahead of us. Mm -hmm. In the world of COVID, there's very little precedent for what we're going through. So when I spent the first half of March asking people, what do you think the changes are? How do we need to adapt? What can we be doing differently? I realized after like the fifth conversation, these are great nuggets of wisdom that I'm getting mm -hmm. from all these smart people. So why not share them? And the yeah. extrovert in me just had to get out there. So as I told you on the phone beforehand, you know, the, the people we're thinking about most are the sick and those that are on the front lines caring for them. That second group are those that immediately find themselves out of work and not quite sure how they're gonna pay bills, but they need the resources and hopefully we can mm -hmm. uh, give some guidance there. But then thirdly, where where I think my skill set lends the most value to be able to help are those small businesses, those entrepreneurs, those startups that are trying to process all this information coming at them and then finding a way forward. And so Phil, for anybody that doesn't know Phil Diller, uh, the perfect person to talk to about all these. When you look at his LinkedIn profile, you'll wonder when he ever has time to sleep in terms of all the activities in from being a coach, a mentor, uh, a thought leader, uh, a team builder. Uh, it, it, you're all over the place, Phil, for all the right reasons. And I was excited uh, when you said you come on to the show live here to talk about your experiences. And I wanna tee you up by what you just said before we started rolling the camera. Let's go back to that point. You're looking at COVID and this disruption through three lenses. Mm -hmm. Urgent lens of how we need to respond immediately. The second lens are those, um, what is it more of the situational change? What was the second, how'd you describe the second? So the first lens is, is urgent. The second is systematic and third right. is And then the third, right. The third I think is that foundational change. And mm -hmm. we're gonna hopefully in our 20, 25, 30 minutes together, get into each one of those elements. Uh, but with that, I just want to say thank you for being here again this morning. Uh, how are you doing? How are you adjusting personally? And then let's jump into your three areas that you think are important. Yeah, sure, Joe. Thanks for having me. It's really great to be here. It's good to, to have a conversation with you. And yeah, thanks for asking about you know how I'm doing. I'm I'm here in San Francisco. I haven't really left the house more for for anything more than groceries in the past month. We're I'm in the heart of the city. Things are pretty quiet, pretty stable around here. And um, I think people are mostly doing what they need to be doing. There, there are some folks who are just like anywhere who are, who are, who are stretching yep, out. Yeah, we got some knuckleheads out there still. Yeah, and I think like you said, the most important thing for that, that group, that cohort that is sick or that, that is taking care of people is that we kind of, we stay home and we don't overwhelm the, we don't overwhelm the healthcare system. I've had direct conversations with people in the healthcare system across the country, doctors and, and, and nurses who are in the fight and, you know, I listen to their feedback directly first and, the, and they're saying a consistent story that if you're hoarding help, if you're the best thing you can do otherwise is to, to stay home. And if you've ever seen anybody interviewed about how the illness is, I've, I've seen three or four different folks. It's horrible. Yep. And I, I don't want any part of it. I don't want anybody, you know, my, my immunocompromised parents to have any part of it or, or anybody else. We're all in hot spots. So really concerned about that. But what we've been doing is bonding together as a family. We're like, weekly uh, Zoom calls and regular daily chats on group chats and that sort of thing. So we're leveraging social media as a family right. to stay tight and to keep each other up because it's a tough time for everybody, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm glad to know that you're in that frame. So let's position now the conversation in those three areas, that urgent response, uh, you know, the, the changes that you're talking about in the near term and then long term, those foundational changes. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think the urgent response is is just that, right? What's going on right now outside the doors that outside of us just kind of staying at home? What else do we what else do we do? How do we keep other people mentally and emotionally stable? How do we think about how do we talk about um, 
with other people across the country and really around the world about where they are in dealing with the crisis. Because, well, you know, there are those seven stages of grief that people go through. And as yeah, I talk And by to the people, way, thank you for sending me that podcast. That was a yeah. great example. Because uh, Phil and I talked before on Friday about people are going through the seven stages of grief. So expand on that. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I basically see it as when I talk to people across the country and around the world, different people are in different stages based on whatever city, state they're in, whatever stage they're personally in and dealing with the pandemic and wherever what's going on around them. And yeah. while folks might have different responses everywhere, the, the human response is quite similar. So we might talk to the, in the same day, talk to people who are in different phases, uh, stages of, of that response. So the urgent response is just being there for people, right? Yeah. Talking with them and being able to be adaptable enough and adjust, to, adjust where you are to be a good partner in the urgent response. Yeah, in that idea of urgent response, you have so much experience working with companies, especially startups, small businesses. What's one mm -hmm. or two nuggets of wisdom that we can capture here that you would you know, recommend to them on that urgent response side? Sure, I think for startups, you gotta understand that the game is not over, right? The first thing you think of as, as, a, as a CXO is how do I, how do I maintain, the, the, keep the doors open? How do I yep. manage my burn rate so I can last as long as possible? The second yeah. thing you think about is where do I go for new options? And there are there are CMO, there are CXOs at companies across the country who are looking for support and solutions to get stuff done. The, yeah. the, the doors are not closed. There are industries that are rapidly growing, companies that are going, they're dealing with challenges. And if you can help them, this is a great opportunity for you to step up and show what you can do. Well, that's a nice segue to your second point, which is systematic changes. So what are some of the systematic changes either in government or in business or in people's daily lives that you think that we need to start thinking about going forward? Yeah, people are, the systematic stuff is a little, a little tough because I think, you know, you hear that, that, uh, that quote, and I don't know exactly where it came from, but the never let a crisis go to, go to waste. Yeah, quote. it's attributed to Ron Emanuel, the governor, the mayor of Chicago when he was in the White House sure. uh, during the last recession. But I think I've heard it. I've heard that long before he actually said it. Um, yep. And by in my interpretation of the way we say that is, look, if there's something that brings you to crisis around an issue, you don't want to just solve band aid the issue. It might actually be the point where it changes your paradigm about how you think about something, where you 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 triage the patient, but you don't necessarily give the same sort of. Uh, uh, treatment that you might have given previously, right? Because there might be underlying, fundamental, systematic issues that you just need to address. And now is as good a time as any to address some of those things, yeah. right? Well, on that note, I want to interrupt briefly just because yeah. uh, Kyle Cox popped on and says, hello, Phil. I didn't know that he was in your circle as well as mine. Now I feel even yeah. more honored to know Kyle. In fact, <laughs> yeah. small world story, just a quick digress. So uh, summer of 2011, when I moved to uh, Austin, leaving the Pentagon, had this idea for Ride Scout, and I was at this uh, entrepreneur summit, and I'm in the very back row trying to be really quiet, and uh, I lean over to this guy next to me, he's real friendly, we're just making small talk between speakers, and I said, you know, I got an idea for this transportation app. I really think after hearing all these speakers that I could build on this, and then Kyle looked over at me, who I didn't know, his name was Kyle at the time, and he said, why don't you come see me and talk to me about it sometime? And I thought, well, okay, sure. And then sure enough, <laughs> MC uh, introduces Kyle as the very next speaker. And I'm like, holy cow, here I am talking to a subject matter expert. And he gets down and explains the world of startup. But that's a nice segue to uh, this idea of systematic changes. So if you're a small business, if you sure. are an entrepreneur, what are you thinking about when you talk about this idea of, so you've got a crisis, you've got a moment. What are some of the systematic changes that you're thinking that you'd recommend to them? Well, I mean, I think they have to look at the they have to look at what they saw that was broken in the system and see if some of people's fundamental assumptions have actually been challenged. What do I hear a lot about? I hear a lot of people talking about this being a time to slow down and think or yep. a time where there's potentially a reset in the economy. I hear people who think about clean tech and energy and they see now a different level of connectedness around the world that they didn't before. And yep. whether you whatever you believe about climate change. There are certain things you can't deny about how we use plastics, how we consume energy, our need for food and water, and our, the connectedness of our ecosystems, right? And in any of those, if you think about sustainability, if you think about how you're going to 
how are you going to consider models of capitalism for the future that actually allow us all to live a decent standard of living? There are probably some systematic changes that need to happen. There are probably some thoughts yep. in your mind about how you price certain inputs that have to be ch have to be changed. I don't think that the I don't think that the free market doesn't work. I think that there are some systematic perceptions about cost that are undervalued or about impacts that aren't fully put, put it baked into the prices of products that people really need to really need to think about and they're starting to, right? Yeah. So if you're if you're an entrepreneur, you think, is there something fundamentally that might have changed in my business? And can you go out and test it? Yeah. Well, it brings up a great point. I was listening to the new Make Me Smart podcast by the folks from Marketplace. It's Kai Rizdal and Molly. Mm -hmm. And he said, very frankly, capitalism doesn't care if you live or die. And I think mm -hmm. that leads to the third point, which you talk about, which is foundational changes and foundational mm -hmm. reform that we go forward. So if there's ever a debate between capitalism and socialism, I'm choosing capitalism every day of the week. Sure. However, we can see now why there needs to be a better social safety net for a mm -hmm. lot of people that are left out. So sure. when you talk about foundational uh, reform going forward, what mm -hmm. are some of the things that you're thinking about? I talk about evolu an evolution of capitalism to, uh, to, to think about more of the inputs. I think right. the folks who are talking about the fourth sector are in the starting in the right direction. I think when we talk about UN sustainable development goals, we're moving in the in the right direction. But like for me, I think about I want to build startups or facilitate the creation of startups that are venture funded companies that are impactful on UN sustainable development go goals that are scalable because we know they can apply their solutions to 100, 500, 1,000 cities or communities and that are profitable, right? That are that are that are delivering equity to everybody in the value chain, so that there's not too too things don't go too high and too low, um, that you elevate the standard of a global middle class. That that to me is like a, a, a aspirational foundational thing that we talk about. And if we if we think about the standard of living of most Americans and how we're doing so much better than so many other people globally, but we still have so many problems here to fix, it can feel it could feel overwhelming when we think about some of these problems, but if we tackle some foundational elements that actually scale, it could be really impressive the sort of the sort of impact that we can have. And yeah, there are so whether, many places to deliver. Yeah, and whether that's water or medicine, malaria around the world, it is fascinating mm -hmm. how when we think as entrepreneurs about innovation, sometimes we think a little too small. And mm -hmm. I think the foundational changes you are talking about are to be applauded. In fact, it even makes me think of one part of our book, Catalyst, that Brett Boyd and mm -hmm. I wrote, uh, that talks about the fact that capitalism and globalization have created mm -hmm. forces that are lifting the overall quality of life for everybody around the world. Mm -hmm. However, COVID, because it's going to have probably a uh, a knee-jerk reaction by a lot of people perhaps to bring supply chains back home. It's important to know that the reason why China over the last 40 years lifted the quality of life in China was because their ability to participate in free markets. And then when their labor got to be more expensive vis-a-vis -vis other countries like Vietnam or others, we right. can just look globally that if we don't figure out a way to keep those countries and those populations in the economy, we might go back to another problem where we're killing far more people through access to bad water or access to clean water, lack thereof and lack of food. So sure. It's all connected. That's sure, the bottom absolutely. line. Absolutely. Let's and take it to another take it to another level too. Please. Let's talk let's talk about um, Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa, right? Which are critically important opportunities for America to diversify our investment and value chain, right? If you look at Sub-Saharan Sub Africa in terms of the African Union, in terms of the ter growth of technology hubs, in terms of the stability of governments by and large that have, that have accelerated over the past you know, couple decades, there is incredible opportunity. And when I talk to entrepreneurs, I'm drawn into conversations in countries I never expected to be in, Wow. Uh, like Uganda and South Africa and Ghana and uh, Zambia. And folks are saying, we want America to be here. They want yeah. us. They want like, guys like you and me to, to go in there together as a team and to be helping uh, bring American innovation and investment because there's been, a pretty, there's been a pretty extractive investment by the Chinese, right? Oh yeah, they're there in a huge way in a lot huge of countries way. around the world that people might not be paying attention to. Oh yeah. And then, you know, we do have to think about 
how do we deal with China? Because I think about it this way, we're not playing the same game, right? We come to the market in a different way than the, the Chinese Communist Party comes to the market, right? There might be free markets to an extent in, in, in dealing with China, but it's just not the same, same game. It's not, you know, it, one, it's not like checkers versus chess because that implies that somebody's smarter than somebody else, but it's like soccer versus American football. They're just completely different games yep. and you can't like put them on the same, same playing field and expect a common result. So, I mean, I understand that we need to push back and we need to think about foundationally, how do we do things differently? And, and this is a time to really critically think about all the factors on the table and then and develop a strategy. And it th I think it comes from the entrepreneurs. It comes from a civically minded, uh, comprehensively thinking entrepreneur who's, who's bringing all those, all those factors together as we talked about. Well, Phil, you literally just set up the next question perfectly. When you talk about entrepreneurs, you talk about civic minded, you talk about opportunities. We got a question here on Facebook that came in from Miles Murray, who is also an entrepreneur uh, with some really cool ideas. Uh, mm -hmm. But his question is more big picture, which is what are the opportunities that you see for renewable energy companies in that particular sector, especially in the early stages, and how they need to be focusing their efforts in this period of disruption? Gosh, I could talk about that for a, a long time. I, Maybe we'll come answer, back with another podcast, but what's the, uh, the yeah. quick two minutes? Um, short answer is, I mean, there's incredible opportunity for that, right? Uh, I was just looking at a statistic just last night the renewable energy sector has more jobs in it now in the U.S. than the petroleum-based energy yep. sector does. Same, same thing here in Texas as well. Right, which is crazy, which is one of the things that we talked about. And it's, it's not, it is doing it for all the right reasons. Now, now, we could talk about the history of it, but the cost, even without carbon in the hidden, factoring in the hidden cost of carbon, those technologies are better. So integrated demand side management is the future of not only American distributed energy system. And for those that aren't energy nerds, integrated demand management, you want to talk a little more about what that means? Yeah, right? sure. I would just say to people, if you think about the old energy infrastructure, you would build a power plant somewhere far away from everyone and do these high power, uh, high power uh, tension lines, high tension right. cable lines that would go from where you generate the power to where you consume the power. And what you have in the what you have with, with renewable energy is the ability to have a distributed uh, energy system. It's not one or the other; it's a combinated factor. So I can build local energy by generating solar and wind from my roof and my and my backyard or un, uninhabited space. And there's other areas where you can generate energy, and it's locally generated and stored and distributed. And then there's other layers to it, like you can use battery storage in vehicles as emergency energy for a community. There's all sorts of things that you want to think about for having resilient communities so that the next time we have massive wildfires in California, we don't shut down power to the, to the major sectors of the Bay Area because of fear of more tension uh, cable lines coming down. So yeah. someone's building an energy efficiency, energy solution. What other opportunities? They're huge. But the big challenge is you have to get your technology past the, the, the technical line of death, right? Yep. Yeah, the valley of death. You have to be significantly better than something that's in the marketplace right now. And you have to find the ability to get traction and prove the value of your product um, in a real environment. And those things are, are pretty, pretty tricky. Yeah, well, you gave me an idea for two more future uh, interviews. Shannon Sintel is a buddy of mine, Army buddy, goes way back in the day. And he is now out of the Army working for a company called Stealth Power. It has a new power management system to have uh, basically an auxiliary power unit on board, primarily right now, uh, emergency responder vehicles, police, fire, mm -hmm. ambulance. Uh, and in this time of COVID, it'd be fascinating to see how those technologies are playing out. And then, of course, our friend John Powers, who has been in this space uh, for a very long time as well with his work at Clean Capital. So we'll do that. So we're, we're getting close here to the end. So I just want to mm -hmm. take a moment to, to allow you to add one more nugget, anything else we haven't discussed. I mean, you and I have talked about other things like what entrepreneurs can be doing about connecting people, talk about opportunities for new business models, tons of things to think about, but with just a minute or so left, what do you want to leave the viewers with as they are going forward, thinking about how they live in this life dis disrupted? Yeah, you know, I would encourage people to, to think about what they're most about, 
what they what the, what's the drives them and how do they stay focused during this time right how do you how do you how are you like darren hardy might say how might you have insane productivity during this period yep. keep your mental health steady uh have a disciplined routine get really focused about what it is you're trying to accomplish and don't assume that anything is off the table just because there is a whole lot of chaos around there is a great opportunity to engage with people and bring things forward. I'd inspire people to do it. I think these conversations are critically important. I've been working with my partners to try and de develop similar sort of conversations. We have them as town halls and that sort of thing. And I'd love to just for everybody to keep, keep listening and talking and communicating because those of us who are talking about how do we accelerate out of the curve, out of the crisis are leading the, leading the change and leading the real conversations that we need to have in our communities, in what we demand from our leaders in policy, and policy, and where we'll build the new business models in the future. That's, that's where we are, and this is a community that's going to do it. So I'm, yeah. it's an honor to be a part of it. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Thanks for keeping Well, I'm glad you're able to make it. In fact, you bring up a good point, which is I'm, I'm capturing every one of these. You're, I think, interview 18 or 19. I'm losing track now. Uh, I've got a medium post where I basically just stream them one after the other. People can use various hashtags to see what they're most interested in uh, and listen or re-listen uh, to some of those. And then I'll also ask you, as I move this over on to LinkedIn, so it's there as well, you brought up a lot of great ideas. You mentioned some podcasts. Since I'm a one-man band, I'm doing more uh, listening to you than I am taking notes. So anything that once we post it in LinkedIn or even on Facebook, you can add those links. That'd be very helpful. And to your own work so people can learn more about what your organization is doing. Like I say, when you read your LinkedIn about section, uh, I don't even know when you sleep, Phil, but it's good, it's good to know uh -huh. that you're doing it. So we end like we do every time, which is to remember that it's those that are sick and those that are on the front lines caring for them are first in our thoughts. Second, mm -hmm. right behind them, of course, are to make sure that the people that are immediately out of work have the resources and keep that optimism when I know it is stressful to be able to figure mm -hmm. out how you're going to make ends meet. And then that third group that I'm trying to help the most, because that's where my skill sets are, are those small businesses and entrepreneurs trying to figure out how they retool. And as you said, figure out their urgent response. Secondly, mm -hmm. their systematic changes. And then long-term, their foundational reforms, which by the way, I love all three of those. And I'm going to be repeating those and giving you credit going forward because that really is how we need to be thinking about this. So to everyone that's out there, stay home, save lives, do the right thing, and uh, we'll get through this together. Thanks again, Phil, for being a part of this. Thanks, Joe. Great to be here. Take care.